Hello again to the second video of my European Thought video series. This video series follows a logic sequence and when interrupted causes misunderstanding. So I would encourage you to start always with my first video and then go to the second one and so on. But uh, without further ado, welcome to this channel. While we spoke mostly about blade properties in a revealing outside fashion, I will cover with this video the inside mechanism of the blade. The usability of a sword blade is not only determined by its point of balance, oscillation nodes, point of percussion or pivot point, and weight distribution and so on, but also by the material it is made of and how the heat treatment was applied. To understand this better, we will have to dive into the molecular level of steel. This becomes excessive as a topic and I will have to oversimplify the model to use like the atom model you were teached in school with a center nucleus and orbiting electrons as this is too simple and actually a lie I will also have to lie in order to keep the things as understandable as possible. But if we get the principles out of it, it should suffice for us. The hardness is a very important feature of the blade. I am not so much concerned about the edge hardness, but more about the blade hardness in general. See, as long as a European blade has a usable hardness, the hardness of the edge will be within acceptable limits automatically. If good blades clash against each other, both sorts will take edge damage that's a given. If you like cutting, then a very hard and not so hard blade edge will perform initially the same. The softer blade you probably have to resharpen a bit earlier maybe. I say maybe because with a softer two edged sword I have two edges to waste, while with one-edged swords I can not change through and will have to use always one side and even if this edge is harder it will probably be wasted earlier than two softer ones. The cutting is most dependent on the distal taper of the blade, the sharpness of it, the angle of impact in relation to the direction of movement of the blade and also the mass inertia. So a harder edge becomes actually a minor factor inside the whole cocktail of factors and will play initially almost no role at all. So as the hardness is not so important for the edge of the blade, but the blade itself is very petite about the hardness and you can mess up big time. The hardness and heat treatment decides if a blade breaks 
on impact or if it can flex back to its original form. The heat treatment will decide if your blade bends and stays crooked or if it can swallow the shock by opposing it. To see how hardness affects a blade, we have to start with the microcosmos of the very particles that get affected and cause the desired behavior of the blade. So let's see. In order to understand the behavior of steel, I have to oversimplify the atomic mechanism. This topic by itself is so rich that I cannot cover it faithfully. We should keep it simple and easy enough for us to understand. So as you can see here represented as a simple ball, the iron atom has a lot of electrons, protons and neutrons. A lot of electrons means a good and strong bonding ability with the neighboring atoms. Let's leave it at that. Iron becomes under high temperatures liquid and loses therefore its bonding abilities. The melting point is reached at 1535 degrees Celsius, which is 2795 degrees Fahrenheit. When it cools down and gets solid, iron likes to form a crystal which is a cubical structure with eight corner atoms and one in the center of. That is called a body centered cubic and this is also called ferrite. Of course those crystals also interlink with each other as you can see here. Here we can see a frame which limits the movement of the atoms. This limit is the degree of bonding strength the atoms have. In order to show a force that is not visible to us, I chose to represent it as a frame around the atoms. As you can see here, the atoms are limited in their movements, but they are not totally static. If you take iron and you heat it, the let's call it vibration of the atoms becomes more and more violent till they cannot hold on to each other anymore and break apart. Iron is now liquid. This ability to move a little bit is also the reason why you can deform an iron bar relatively easy by applying a big enough outside force. Therefore, iron is not strong enough to be used as a blade. Because of the freedom of moving, the atoms don't support each other that well and tend to give way for deformation too easy. But what if we can limit that movement so they don't have this freedom to get out of the way. This is done with the most important and also very inexpensive carbon. And now comes our crystal again. By putting a carbon atom within a iron crystal structure, you distort its lattice. By doing so, you create a permanent tension that doesn't allow a lot of movement anymore and therefore the material becomes very hard but also brittle. The atomic iron lattice gets so distorted that only one carbon atom finds space in a big large iron crystal compound. This distorted lattice and the cause tension thereof makes the material very hard and therefore able to resist penetration better.
So we know by putting in a carbon atom into the iron crystal lattice we produce stress. But how to get the carbon atom into a crystal that has no space for it? The answer is heat. When we heat up the iron it will change its body centered cubic crystal at about 1526 degrees Fahrenheit into a face centered cubic crystal. Face centered cubic crystals are still solid of course, but they are a little bigger than body centered ones. In a face centered cubic there are still 8 corner atoms present, but no atom is in the middle of. Instead we find in the middle of the cubic sides new atoms. A face centered cubic crystal is called austenite. And it has more space for carbon atoms to go in between the crystal compound. This is what a blacksmith does if he wants to harden a blade. He heats it to about 1550 degrees Fahrenheit to get a face centered crystal structure in the steel. If carbon is present and in steel it is, the carbon atoms squeeze themselves into the crystal lattice. Now if you would allow a slow cooling of the material the carbon would have enough time to diffuse away from the increasing pressure of the collapsing austenite into ferrite. If you accelerate the cooling to a point that the crystal transformation is faster than the time the carbon needs to diffuse, you trap it so to say in the collapsed crystal structure. This fast cooling is called quenching and is done mostly in oil or water since air is not fast enough to cool the metal in time. What you get after quenching is a glass hard material with a highly distorted lattice. The inside stress is so intense that the material is very brittle and technical not usable. Yes it's super hard but it behaves like glass. You don't want to have a glass blade believe me. So now our trade off starts. In order to get a blade that can withstand shocks better, we have to get rid of some hardness to make the material softer. Softer material can absorb outside impacts much better. So the material has to be tensed enough not to lose its shape, but it also has to be soft enough not to break at the first contact with another body. We can say the harder, the more brittle, the softer, the tougher. But don't forget to soft means very tough, but by absorbing energy, a too tough blade would lose its shape. Too hard means too brittle and the blade would crack easy on impact. So we take the glass hard blade after quenching and put it into an oven. At about 600 degrees Fahrenheit we relax the blade a little. This is called tempering. We heat up the blade just enough for the carbon atom to move a little more out of the atomic lattice. Of course not as much as not to distort the crystal anymore. As the tempering heat gets too high, the material gets relaxed again and the carbon atoms show no effect anymore. A new quenching and tempering would be necessary. Another word about tensile strength. Tensile strength is very important in swords. And I have again a little Lego model here. So those Lego pieces are also held together by a rubber band. This rubber band is pretty loose. So I can easily take them apart. And of course they will go back together because of the rubber band. But as you can see I can make a barely big uh, gap. I can take him apart 
very easy. This would be a hardened blade again and the rubber band is uh, put around several times. So it's very hard to put them apart and if I really put a lot of force into it I risk that of course the rubber band will break. This tensile strength in the material gets basically stronger and stronger the harder the material is. Of course there is always a boundary, a threshold where the material gets too hard and gets too brittle and breaks easy. But if the material is tempered the right way, you can reach a unbelievable tensile strength, for example. This sword blade is made out of 5160 spring steel, which is a alloy steel and it has a 5mm um, rod here. This 5mm rod, that is of course the same material as the blade is, so it's not welded on or something like that, but that's uh, something we talk about later. This rod has basically uh, the ability to take a hundred kilograms per square millimeter. The cross section is 20 millimeter. So that little rod can take two tons. The uh, average mid-size car in the United States is 1.8 tons. So I would be able to hang a whole car on this little rod. Why this rod should have such a strong tensile strength, we are going to cover later. At the end of this first video, I would like to review the hardness again. Talking about hardness, if you were hard enough to cope with my strong accent and my limited English, I congratulate you and I am very impressed uh, with your hardness. But there is a point that is misunderstood very often. And I would like to show this to you. Flexibility and toughness. See, a lot of people kind of confuse flexibility with toughness. The harder a material is, the less tough it is usually. Because toughness is more reflected in absorbing energy and it can also mean by absorbing energy that for example a sword blade gets disfigured uh, permanently. Flexibility on the other hand is the ability to act as a spring and the spring for a lot of people is something soft, but it isn't. And I would like to show it to you with those little Lego Technic uh, models. See, this is a Lego Technic uh, model and you can see that there is a rubber band. But this rubber band is quite loose. So there is not really a lot of tension on the rubber band right now. So when I move um, uh, this uh, rod, you can see that it will not go back to its straight form. Yeah, that would be for example, let's say a blade. And when I hit the blade, it bends and it will also go back a certain way, but not all the way. So what you have is a crooked blade. That thing is very tough and I cannot break it, really, but I can bend it like hell and it truly stays crooked afterwards. This for example is a blade and our example it's hardened. So the rubber band is very very tightly put onto. Yes, I can 
put force on it, but it flexes always back. And that's a feature that is desirable on the blade. However, if I flex too much, because this blade is not so tough, so if I put too much pressure on the rubber bands that are already tensed a lot, they break. And the blade is broken. Now you could say, well, I rather have a bent blade than a broken one. But I have to tell you something. Before this blade that is, let's say, tempered the right way, heat treated the right way, before that blade will break, this blade will lose its shape. So this blade, the hardened one, that has a spring uh, properties, will definitely be, on my opinion, the one that I would prefer. And I have a little video for you that should show what I mean. das nicht anders erwartet. Also das ist genau das, was ich eigentlich gedacht habe. Man kann jetzt sehr gut an dem Schwert sehen, man könnte jetzt sofort mit weiterkämpfen, was bei dem japanischen Schwert natürlich nicht mehr möglich war. One word about the katana that you have seen in the video before. I don't want to put down katanas. I like the consistent applied features of a katana and the katana in sword history in Japan is also influenced by a lot of other factors. I chose this example because of the apparent difference in behavior. One being through hardened and obviously of high quality and the other having a soft core approach with also a high quality blade. How do I know this? The guy Behind the mask is a highly skilled and known blacksmith from Germany. He is uh, skilled in the use of katanas as well as in the use of Hema style techniques. He makes katanas even for Japanese customers. He uh, makes European swords of course also. So. For me, we have a very rare example of a true expert. This is why I dared to show you this video. What you see here is a rare example of a more scientific approach. Unfortunately, I think the whole documentary is only in German, which is a pity, because with the English-speaking community, this information would find a very fruitful ground. You have also seen the other European sword being shattered to pieces. 
but only with another European sword that was used against it. And yes, swords can break by abusive behavior. And uh, this was abusive. However, they should not break by touching a little branch and they don't have to. Why a lot of swords just break will appear to a later time. By test cutting you can also bend katanas permanently by not hitting right. A European blade usually doesn't cut through if the target was hit wrong and it will flex back normally. So flexibility through hardness by enough toughness is the approach we have in European blades. This concludes the second video of the series. Bye and I'll be back.